And we're live. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another fantastic episode of Understanding CBD. I'm your host, Stephen Wallman from Wallman's Apothecary. For those that don't know, we do very high-end tinctures, as you can tell, um, very professional labeling. Um, we also have full cannabinoid and terpene profiles. This is actually our gold reserve tincture. For those that don't know, we actually uh, only cook it half of the way. So you have a little bit of the raw CBDA and a little bit of CBD. If you haven't tried it, very high terpenes. So it's almost 4% uh, for a tincture is unheard of. Enough about me. Um, today, we have a fantastic guest that I'm going to introduce you to now. And this topic's very relevant for me personally. I'm living in Maryland. And this next weekend on Saturday, it will be legal to grow in your own home. You can grow up to two plants uh, if you're over 21, and if you have a medical card, you're able to grow up to four plants. So we're going to get some expert advice for starting a legal cannabis grow in your home. And we've recruited an expert here. Um, he may, make, may not call himself one, but he sure is to us. Um, <laughs> please welcome uh, to the show, Jim Barry. Hey, Jim. Hey, Stephen. Thanks for having me. Fantastic, man. And so for those that don't know Jim, um, Jim is a cannabis caregiver in Detroit. Um, he's been a craft cannabis grower for quite some time. He also produces professional videos um, as a professional video producer. Um, and obviously, we know you're not growing cannabis full time for a living. Can you tell us a little bit about what you're doing um, with your, you know, really your skills as a video professional and how that relates to what's going on in the cannabis business? Sure. Yeah, um, it kind of started as a journey last fall. Um, I won't go too much into my past, but I got left at the curb a couple times or at the altar, really, by investors uh, from Canada. And <clears throat> after the pandemic was deciding that I was going to end up in probably middle management at a grow somewhere and interviewed at enough places to realize that it just was not for me. Um, I just saw myself managing processes and um, not so well paid people in the industry, which is another issue that I have with it. Um, so I was kind of getting on LinkedIn and trying to figure out what my next step in life was and kind of had the epiphany to take the two areas of expertise that I have and mix them together and kind of create video and photography and content <clears throat> about cannabis. Um, and it's been focused on educating people, mostly educating home growers at this point. Um, I've been doing a little bit of business to business stuff through the connections that I've made. Um, but my plan is to launch a, a platform that's too focus on educating home growers where oh, that happens to be. That's great. So if, if you do have an cannabis brand and you're looking for someone to can help video, because it, it's not, um, you know, videoing and photographing cannabis is not like normal photo and video because you have all different types of light spectrums that you're dealing that's with if you're, if you're in the actual grow room, right? Yeah, yeah. You've got uh, color temperatures from HPS lights as low as 2,500 degrees Kelvin all the way up to daylight spectrum. So uh, it's a little trickier. Uh, and also working with adding lights, uh, you know, if you're in a flower room and I want to light up somebody's face a little bit, I've got a pretty big battle ahead of me with all those lights hanging. So um, LED technology has come a long, long way as far as uh, spectral tuning for photographers and videographers, essentially, where you can change the color temperature of the light on the fly and just dial it in. So and the intensity. So I use a lot of that type of stuff. So I use a lot of LEDs for uh, photography and video, but also for growing cannabis because they're superior. That's yeah. Fine. Yeah, that's cool. All right. Well, let's let's get to uh, the topic at hand here. You know, I'm not sure if I'm going to be growing or not right now, but um, I am interested in it. And I know a lot of people are also very interested in it, especially here in Maryland and, and really everywhere you can grow it legally um, in, the, in the country. So the first thing that I think about is, all right, um, yeah. Where where do I grow this and what sort of requirements should I start looking to spec out a space? You know, does it have to be, sure. you know, what kind of conditions are we looking for and what kind of space requirements? Sure. And I assume we're talking mostly about indoor. I have very little outdoor experience. Uh, you can grow legally outdoor in a lot of states. There's just different uh, rules that. Yeah, in Maryland, I think it's, it's, got, it's got to be out of sight of people. So I'd imagine it's going to be indoors. So, yeah, it's the same in Michigan. It's not visible from an adjacent property, and it has to yeah, be yeah, similar. So I have a couple in the backyard you can't see, but generally that's not my area of expertise, which would be indoor. Um, so the first thing you're looking for is a space in your home to grow. Um, 
there's a few considerations. Uh, climate control, you want something that you can keep warm enough. Um, <clears throat> and if you need to add something to that, you don't have a big giant space. You want a space that doesn't really need to be any bigger than it has to be. Um, you also want a space that is isolated from the rest of the house. Uh, potentially, it's going to be easier to control the smell that way. Um, also, one thing to note right away is keep your pets away from your grow. They're little walking biohazards that can track powdery mildew <clears throat> or mites or whatnot into your room. So best if you're starting to grow, just keep it a pets free environment. Um, um, now, the, you mentioned like um, so space, it's really up to what you have available and you want to keep correct. it separate. So how many? Yeah, square I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it, it's basically how much space you have available and how many plants you can grow. Um, you're basically creating what's called a canopy, which is the amount of that space that is lit up uh, for production of cannabis, whether it's vegetative or your flowering. So, and then there's going to be area around that that you're going to need for working and for climate control. Um, but you really don't want the, that space to be any bigger than it has to be because it's going to be more difficult to control that climate. Um, <clears throat> ceiling height is another consideration. Uh, you want something that's going to have high enough ceilings that you can create a couple of feet of distance from the plants themselves, um, especially if you're working with bulb fixtures, uh, high pressure sodium lamps. Uh, they tend to want to be further away from the lights because they're creating, uh, from the plants rather, because they're creating a lot of uh, infrared heat that you really don't need, but you'll fry your plants if you get too close to them. So ceiling height and just a nice small space away from everything um, where it's going to be easier to control the odor and keep the pets and curious neighbors, and children, you know, whatever your concerns are. Is there a minimum size that you would say that is required? I've seen some device, some like people uh, sell these like suitcases where you can grow in, um, which are tiny. Um, but is, is there a minimum grow space that you would say, like, if you don't at least have this amount of space, then then don't even bother? Uh, you know, I, I've seen some of those devices, and they could work well, I suppose. My, the only caveat to that, my warning would be that cannabis is a Ferrari among plants. It vegetates and grows and stretches very quickly, and it can get out of control in a small space. Um, that being said, I think uh, most people start with, if you don't have a space already set up, it's common to use a tent. Um, they can contain the smell. They can contain the light. They're aligned with a mylar reflective surface that will make the most of that light. Um, and it's like a little microclimate that you can control. Uh, <clears throat> it's a good size to start with is a three by three or a two by four. Um, but if you're going to go LED, that's a consideration as well, because a lot of these LED lights are not made for tents. That size, a lot of them are four by four, so you're going to want to go with that size tent um, or just okay. shop around fixtures that would fit in the tent you're going to grow in. Okay, so if you don't have a room that can be blocked off by a door or separated, you should you suggest getting a tent. Um, yeah, and, and you might even have that tent inside of a room um, that you're not controlling as closely, but it might be easier to control odor and humidity. Um, from an outer room rather than inside that tent. It also uh, doesn't require you to put equipment inside the tent and take up space and kind of uh, create some heat from the equipment, things like that. If you can get that out of the tent, that's great, and do what additional environmental controls that you need to inside of the tent. But, uh, you know, some people don't have much space to work with, and they got to get it all in there. So I, I would say you don't really want to play with anything smaller than maybe a Okay. So it sounds like deciding on what kind of light fixtures is going to be important and also depending on the space. Um, the, uh, I mean, what sort of questions do we need to ask ourselves in deciding between we're going to go with one of these LED lights or one of the other bulbs? Uh, obviously, budget is a big concern. Um, there are people that think that HPS still produces a better product than LED. I disagree with that, but um, I'm not here to argue with people about that. It's a personal preference. Uh, budget is going to be a big concern. Um, What's the ballpark on these? What's the ballpark well, price? LEDs have come down quite a bit. I, I can't tell you the price on uh, bulb fixtures recently. They're under a few hundred dollars to pick one up. Um, I had some pretty good luck using CMH, which is ceramic metal halide fixtures, before I went to LED. Um, and that would actually fill a three by three tent or a 
two by four tent pretty nicely. Uh, the problem with the bulb fixtures is you cannot dim them um, in most cases. So you're going to be uh, potentially blasting your plant with too much light. And that's where the advantage of the LEDs come in because <clears throat> in some form or another, they're almost all dimmable. Um, so you can just dial it into the um, intensity of light that you need for your plants and not worry about light toxicity. Got it. And if it's something, you know, is, you know, as far as seasonal, um, growing indoor, you can control the environment is what we're going after. Is this um, something that you would want to be able to do year round? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and for somebody who gets a little more into it and decides that they want to set up two little spaces where they have, have a veg and a flower, they can do it cyclically all year and have five, six cycles a year. Um, of course, you got to have the legal plant count for that, of course. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, it's generally something that you could, even in one tent, you could uh, push through a few cycles a year and do it all year round. Okay. So let's say I got a tent. Um, we got a four by four, three by three tent. We got some LED lights in there. What other components are there um, to decide on to get started? Well, it's, you're going to have to control a climate. Um, you know, I guess maybe a, a quick, um, let's talk about the plant itself a little bit. Um, it is, like I said, it's, it's quite a uh, Ferrari, I call it, a plant. It grows quickly and it uses resources quickly, a lot more than other crops will. Um, that being said, you want to, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm sorry, I, I got derailed a little bit. What was the question? Yeah, so I just I'm curious. Like we got the the space and we have the lighting, and um, okay. I'm really wanted to like kind of get this kit together before we start growing. Like, what decisions do I need to make when I'm shopping and getting all these all this equipment together? Um, okay. And, um, well, I mean, I don't know. Let's let's kind of go to this then because um, I know this was on the top of my mind. <laughs> I didn't want to forget it either. The grow medium because um, you can grow in soil, you can grow hydroponically, and I guess that's also like when I'm at the store thinking about what am I going to buy or I'm ordering it. Um, that's a decision I have to make here, also, right? It is. Um, there are a number of things to grow in 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 soil, or a number of inert media's like cocoa and rock wool, or uh, deep water culture we call DWC. Um, I generally recommend for new growers start in soil. It's the most forgiving of them. And uh, generally, once you start getting good at it, it, I believe that it produces the best product. Uh, I've never had plants that I felt expressed themselves as well as they did in soil. Um, but there are plenty of ways to do it. You can work in cocoa. You can work in rock wool. Um, the big difference between that and soil is those mediums generally have no nutrients in them. So you're going to have to add all of the nutrients they need and on a regular basis and you're also going to have to keep those nutrients from building up in the pot if the plant doesn't use them and they start to build up in the pot you can run into issues with uh, toxicity and low ph um, where the plant essentially locks out and isn't able to uptake those nutrients so all right it's so a little more advanced so we're going to start basic we're going to start with soil um can i just go out in my yard and dig up some some dirt mm -hmm. Um, or... You could, uh, you're <laughs> potentially bringing in a whole lot of problems with it. Um, <clears throat> that soil in your yard may work fine, uh, but you're going to be bringing in potentially pests and pathogens that you do not want around your cannabis. Um, most people are going to have to deal with powdery mildew. Uh, they're going to have that present in their environment outside. Spider mites are pretty common. Depending on where you are, you might have russet mites. Western flower thrips, there's a number of pests, aphids, all kinds of things that are going to want to eat the plants. Um, and why I say keep it isolated and also keep it uh, your grow away from external exits as much as possible so that you're not bringing that stuff in inadvertently. Um, always a good idea, too, to lose the shoes and change your clothes if you're going into your grow space. Um, personally, I actually don't go into my grow space except after I've showered and changed clothes. Um, if I'm going to be working out in the yard at all, because I could be tracking spider mites in or powdery mildew spores in. And once they get into a grow room, they can run rampant because there are, at least with the pests, there's no natural predators in that environment. So 
you are the predator. <laughs> yeah, so you got to really think about this as creating in its own environment and its own ecosystem that is separate from really everything else. And to yeah, minimize basically, exposure to you're everything. basically trying to create an environment that has the best that nature has to offer 365 days a year without the problems. Got so it. The best way to do that is with a strict biosecurity plan, which is all right. So where do we get the uh, soil from? Can you buy it along with your other equipment or do you have any recommendations on where to get the soil? Yeah, I think initially, you know, any state that has legal grows is probably going to have grow stores around and find one and talk to some people, find one where you like them and trust them. And typically they'll have a whole section that's all substrates. Um, <clears throat> and you're going to want to look for a good amended soil. Uh, there's a lot of products out there that they call soil that aren't really soil. They're basically cocoa with uh, forest compost in it, which could be uh, nothing more than sawdust in it. And then they've amended it with alfalfa and kelp and a number of things to put the nutrients in it. But I would recommend actually starting with an actual soil that's got some sand and some clay and some silt in it. Um, and then buy it from a manufacturer who's making this for cannabis because they're going to have amended it with all of the things that cannabis needs, um, at least to get started. If you have a big enough pot, you might just grow in soil and never use nutrients at all. Um, another consideration why you want to use a manufacturer like this, they're going to add something to capture air in that because the, the roots are going to need air. Uh, so they'll add <clears throat> pumice or um, perlite to it, um, which captures air inside of the soil. All right. So don't just go to Home Depot, grab any bag of soil. Make sure you get it specifically for cannabis soil. Uh, you, you know, I, it's a recommendation. OK, I, I wouldn't say you can't. Well, it's, 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 like, it's like one of those things where if you you know, the reason we're talking with you because you're an expert. So with your experience, you've seen things come down the road that we can try to avoid right now. So I always like to get advice from experts because you can help me avoid these pitfalls. So. Um, I'm sure yeah. you're not saying this. You're not endorsed by these uh, soil companies. Um, you're saying it for a reason because <laughs> you probably have seen right. some problems <laughs> come up. Right, down. and I, you know they're fairly accountable too. They have online presences. You can talk to people at these manufacturers, ask them questions a lot of times, um, and I have. Um, and they know cannabis, and they're like I said, they're accountable, and you can read the ingredient list right off there. And they generally use pretty good stuff, especially if you're leaning into you know, what we call living soil, um, which is adding a whole world of microbes. There are all sorts of uh, bacteria and fungus living in soil naturally. Uh, some of them are pathogenic and some of them are beneficial to cannabis. And a lot of these soil manufacturers will actually add those to their soil mix. So as you start to water it, you start to get a, a colony of life um, growing down there. It's a, quite a universe down there. Yeah, living soil is the way to go. We do. We we grow our hemp outside with a regenerative food farm, so they're always constantly building up soil with different types of, you know, organic processes to, you know, add fermenting and teas and so forth to, uh, to the soil to build it up. But for an indoor, um, does it matter what size container you put the soil in? It does. <clears throat> with soil, I generally say that the more soil, the better. Big roots, big fruits. Um, I've seen people finish cannabis in small pots, two, three gallon pots, but um, they're not going to get much, and especially if you're not amending it with additional nutrients. So if you're just relying on the soil alone, um, I generally recommend that you go with about four gallons per square foot of canopy. So if you have a four by four light um, and you're growing under that entire canopy, you're going to want somewhere in the neighborhood of 60 gallons of soil. That's if you're not amending at all. You can certainly use less and if you treat it properly, you're plants will produce they're just going to produce less does it um should it, the container be deeper or wider um like a, i'm thinking like a five gallon bucket um or is it better to get something that would be more shaped and and do you want it to be a certain depth or will it will it adjust under the soil i've seen people grow in all sorts of things from five gallon buckets to soil solo cups um Container size, I, I do think cannabis roots have a propensity to grow wide uh, rather than uh, deep, but I don't really have any scientific backing for that. So I might get some pushback on that. I don't know. Yeah. Um, but generally, one thing to consider is height. How much height is that pot 
adding to your overall operation because you know, you're starting right at that soil level and if your light is hanging at five feet, um, you want something that's fairly low to the ground. Got it. You want to make sure that there's enough space between the top of the soil and the where the plant's going to grow up. And Yeah, that's going to be a big challenge that a lot of home growers are going to face is, is managing that canopy height so that it doesn't get too close to the light. If you have LEDs, of course, you can dim the light so that you're not exposing them to too much light. But then by dimming that light, you're also decreasing the light that reaches down into the canopy and and is available to the, the lower bud sites. Um, so do lights so, always go on top or can you also put lights on the sides? Yeah, you can put them on the sides. There's intra canopy where they actually run lights through the canopy or under the canopy um, or side light. But generally you're gonna get a top down scenario. Uh, I've played around with other lighting scenarios and it's, uh, it's fun and a little gimmicky, but I didn't really notice that there was that big of an increase in yield that it was worth the hassle and expense. Got it. So a typical room, let's say, is an eight foot ceiling. If you get these tents, I don't know, maybe they're six feet tall. Is that tall enough for, um, for you know, grow? Is there like a minimum height requirement? Uh, it's a lot of the tents actually, it's pretty common for them to stop around seven feet, uh, I guess, maybe so they fit comfortably in an eight foot room. Uh, and a seven foot tent is generally pretty good size. You could handle a CMH light or an LED light in there. I'd be a little wary about putting an HBS in a tent, um, but uh, no, I'm sure there's guys doing it. All right, and it's self, um, it's self supporting. Do you have to fortify the tent at all with anything? Is is it going to be enough yeah. to hold the equipment? Yeah, no. The, all of these tents are, are sent with the framework. Uh, everything snaps together pretty easily, and then they have support rods that go across the top, and they're rated. It should tell you how many pounds it's rated for, but they're all built to the point where they should hold some gear suspended from them. Okay. Um, and they're, like I said, they're all reflective lined. They'll have <clears throat> ports everywhere for electrical access or for uh, venting air in and out of the tent, um, either at the bottom or the top. They're kind of designed to, okay. you know, so you can set them up the way you want. All right. And they're so, very affordable now. You can buy one for a couple hundred bucks. Oh, really? Okay. Maybe less even, yeah. Now, now, as far as controlling this environment, this was kind of a question I had earlier, which is, are there any other elements? Because I know you're looking at... Um, temperature and humidity, are, th are those managed by um, devices? Yeah, so the, the next consider, the first thing you're gonna want, of course, is a light. Um, the, the next things you're gonna run into are humidity and temperature control. Um, plants, especially when the lights are on, they spend all day transpiring, which is essentially like sweating. They're releasing um, water vapor out of the, the bottom of the leaves and evaporates into the air and that's going to raise the relative humidity in the room. So you want to have a dehumidifier, probably is going to be the first things that you add. Um, and also as those devices are producing heat, it's gonna warm up the room and you may wanna look at some kind of small air conditioning system. Um, if you're doing it in a tent, you might look at controlling the humidity of and the temperature of the room as a whole and then just venting air in and out of that tent and monitoring temperature and humidity. Uh, it might be easier than trying to cram all that equipment into your tent. Oh, okay. So if you have the space in the room, you so a dehumidifier and an air conditioner in the room versus in the tent, and then you'll have a sensor in the tent that's going to tell right. you this, and then you can either vent or not vent. or You can either increase the venting or you can adjust the, the humidity controls and temperature controls in the room to get the ideal conditions you want in the tent. Um, a good way to set up the tents actually is to um, pull air from the tent and push it out of the room from the top of the tent so that it draws air up from the vents in the bottom and through the canopy, uh, which will help prevent what we call microclimates, where you get little pockets of air inside the tent where there might be a spike in humidity that's you know 75% where mold might grow, um, even though the rest of the tent is reading 55%. Do these tents typically come with vents in the top with fans, or is that something you would also want to think about? You would, yeah, you might look at an inline fan. So they make little devices that um, can be mounted right to the top of the tent. I use zip ties, um, rope ratchets, and different things to hang them. And you can pull air from the tent and push it out. Uh, you can also use that as a first line of defense for odor mitigation, which is something we haven't really talked about, which is something you're also uh, going to want to do right away. Because it stinks. It stinks a lot. And 
I know every time I lose power, this whole house goes from smelling, you can barely smell it, to it smells like a dead stump somewhere <laughs> in about five minutes. So um, odor mitigation is probably one thing you're going to want to look at right away. You might find that you don't need a dehumidifier right away or that you don't need an air conditioner right away, but you're going to want odor mitigation right away. Um, the f easiest and most common way people do it is what's called a carbon scrubber, and you can find them at these grow stores as well. It's a, a cylindrical device that has it's filled with carbon, essentially, and it allows for air intake, and then there's a pre-filter that goes over top of it that grabs dust. Um, and you take one of these inline fans um, and push air into it or pull air through it. I tend to like to pull air through it, um, and it will remove <clears throat> most of the odor from the, from the room. 100%? Um, no. You're still going to smell a little bit here and there, um, but they do a pretty good job. And if you really want to get fancy, you can look at uh, something called PCOs, photocatalytic oxidizers. That what is that called? PCO. Like, PCO. It's a photocatalytic oxidizer. There's a number of manufacturers. Um, they're a little more expensive. I think you can get them for under a thousand dollars. But it's kind of like ozone light. It uh, creates a, a HO hydroxyl pixel that um, breaks down very rapidly. Um, faster than ozone, but as it draws air through this device, it will kill virus, it will kill bacteria, it will kill fungus, it will kill VOC, so it will um, deaden the smell quite a bit. But I use them in addition to carbon filters, so I've got two carbon filters and uh, a, a POC in my room right now, and I don't really smell it at all. Yeah. All right. Um, and you might be used to it also. If someone else came in the house, maybe. They... <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm a little nose blind to cannabis. I assume that I just walk around smelling like a flower room all the time. <laughs> uh, yeah. It's very pungent. You start touching that stuff and it, uh, it goes with you. The oils end up on your skin and it's hard to get off with anything. Oh, uh, if you start working with cannabis, uh, keep your old oil, your old cooking oils, olive oil. It's great for washing your hands with that if you've been in the room. It'll take all of that sticky stuff right off and leave your do hands you, nice and clean. Uh, do you wear gloves when you go in to touch the plants? or? I don't. I prefer to uh, to not wear gloves. My hands sweat a lot in the gloves, and it's just uncomfortable. Um, so I wash my hands a lot. Also, keep your fingernails short. You might be carrying around uh, fungus spores under your fingernails. You probably are. You don't realize it. Um, so I don't wear gloves. A lot of people prefer to. Actually, some people that grow cannabis and use cannabis, uh, will have an allergic reaction to growing it, even though they're able to to smoke it and use it. Um, so they'll wear gloves and you see them full length sleeves a lot of times when they work. Okay. And it's just something you'll know when you start doing it. All right. Well, so it sounds like um, just adding up some of the basic numbers to really set up a room, a grow tent. Um, you're talking about a couple thousand dollars. I think you can get started for less than that. A tent, uh, you know, there's some inexpensive tents on the market that you can probably get for under a couple hundred dollars. Uh, LED lights have come down quite a bit in price over the past couple of years, a lot of competition. Um, I've seen fixtures that were uh, pretty good fixtures for about 500, <clears throat> maybe even a bit under at this point. Uh, so maybe you, if, if you're doing it, uh, you can probably get it under a thousand dollars. I would say you could probably get started for under a thousand and then you might end up spending a little more reactively as you start to get into it and realize, oh, I need this or I need that. Right, right. Okay. So uh, I think you've given us enough to get the room started and, and the environment. So um, so now it would be ready to grow. When you get started, I know you can either start from a clipping from someone else or a clone, or it can start starting from seeds and, and germinating that yourself. Do you have any tips on which way to go? Uh, I prefer clones just because you know generally what you're getting already. Um, it's been from an established line, essentially, that uh, you know, you're just repeating. Um, but clones may not be available to somebody. The other thing to keep in mind when you're taking clones from someone is you might be taking their problems with you. It might be infected with powdery mildew or might have rust or something like that. I had a case of that not too long ago, a couple years ago, where somebody that I knew and trusted from California just basically mailed me powdery mildew and he didn't think it was a big deal. And uh, he was sadly mistaken. <laughs> <laughs> it took me a while to chase it out of my operation. So if you're taking clones from somebody, make sure they're a trusted source. 
Um, seeds are a different animal. They're going to generally not bring problems with them, but you're going to have to plant them all and hunt for that genetic that you want yourself. Uh, and if, in fact, if you're in a state that has really low plant counts, that's going to be difficult because when you, when you use seeds, generally we do what are called pheno hunts because seeds, although they may all be the same variety, uh, have very different expressions from seed to seed. They're as different as children. Um, so we generally do what are called pheno hunts where you plant a bunch of seeds of the same variety and take them all to uh, maturity. And before you flower them or at some point you clone all of them and see them all through to uh, harvest essentially and decide which ones you want to keep. And then that becomes the basis. So you're going to weed out the males. You're going to weed out the females that you don't like the way they grow or the way that the flower they produce. Um, so that could be pretty difficult in an environment where they're limiting you to two plants or four plants. You're kind of just going to be. Yeah. I mean, when do they consider, and when do they consider a plant a plant? It's kind of like the uh, abortion discussion, but uh, you know, like, is it as soon as the seed sprouts, that's considered. Yeah, I, I, I think as soon you know, I'm not a, a lawyer and I can't uh, advise <laughs> when a plant is a plant. And, uh, but I think a lot of states will look at it as soon as it has roots. So, as soon as that seed sprouts or as soon as that cutting starts to develop roots, um, it's a plant. I'd imagine they'd have to have the dispensaries that are licensed now offering you know, clones or small plants that you can start with. I, I, they'd have to do something like that. Yeah. And when I heard about the Mar the two plants in Maryland, that's it's almost laughable. There's obviously some lobbyists from uh, Big Canna that are working towards keeping it out of people's houses because it's it's difficult to set up a perpetual grow with two plants and it just um, makes the fact that um a cannabis business would prevent someone growing from home is ridiculous it's just like it's like tomatoes it's not like if you grow tomatoes at home you're never going to go out to eat um it's it's a big investment in growing yourself it's not it's not even like something i would even see as competitive but i guess it's it's the mindset of the industry yeah, they want all the money. What other crop or hobby in the United States is legal uh, recreationally to use? Alcohol, whatever it happens to be, but you can't do it at home. Yeah, I mean, it's un American for me. It, it, it makes zero sense. And then to limit the, you know, because I know they also wanted, at least in Maryland, to create some value in this medical card. So they have it's the biggest question that's going on in Maryland now is, should I get my card or should I just go with 21 and over? Now, obviously, if you need medical cannabis and you're under 21, um, you'll be obviously using a caregiver and, and someone can help you with with getting your um, your medical cannabis that way. But if you're over 21, the, the value of getting your medical cannabis card is you can then grow four plants instead yeah, of it's not four. Right. <laughs> it's which might make it a little easier to clone and, you know, create lines. Yeah, it's if you want like you would want that flexibility because, tight. yeah, because if you're even, yeah, you're just you know, setting that up. So, all right, so that's helpful to getting may, it started. You may also consider uh, this is kind of based on a model that a friend of mine used to run years and years ago, but they kind of teamed up where um, one guy kept the genetics and kept things in a, a perpetual state of veg and another guy did all the flowering. So that might be another way of approaching it. That's actually not a bad idea is to build some sort of like a co-op or a group of people that are, yeah. are growing. So have one person in there, keep an environment for just the, the mother plants. And then yeah, I've got the clones. I got the mothers. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Hodgepodge a little network together. So in so, yeah, yeah. variety, is there a, um, you know, I know you go into the dispensary and they're talking about indigo sativa and hybrid and, you know, one has this effect or the other effect. Um, when it comes to growing, um, at least when I was familiar with growing before, the indigo sativa was more of the size, like one would grow taller, one would typically grow shorter, which is why they would be these hybrids. Um, any specific uh, suggestion on what type to get? Uh, I guess you're digging into an area where there's, I, you know, there's some controversy. I don't really believe in the whole indigo sativa classification to begin with. Um, it's all based on some history that doesn't really sync with the way we look at the plant. Uh, you know, there was cucumber sativa and all sorts of sativas. It was basically anything that was cultivated in Europe at the time. Um, but try explaining that to the average person coming into the dispensary. So 
we've kind of assigned this set of attributes to a type of plant that we call sativa and one that we call indigo, even though I believe it's generally all the same plant, hemp included. It's just a matter of what cannabinoids are present, what terpenes are present, how it's adapted to its environment and been cross-pollinated with other, other plants. You know, just because something has THCA in it doesn't mean it's necessarily a different plant than industrial hemp. It just grows differently. Um, that being said, you're going to want to pick something that isn't going to get too big for your room. So really, that's the biggest factor is how much is it going to stretch you know, from a cultivator's perspective. Um, from there, it's just personal preference. How long is it going to take the flower? Is it something that's going to be done once the flower cycle starts in eight weeks? Or is it going to take 14 weeks? Um, you know, there are some sativas out there that have very, very long flowering cycles, but to that uh, person who's using it, they're definitely worth the wait. Okay. So, yeah. So, so select one that would be the appropriate based off of these, this environment that we're setting up seems like the way to go. Um, yeah, now, yeah, you know, before you grow it, see if you can smoke it. Yeah. That's actually a good way to, to prove it out. Um, and, and I know we, there's a lot of details to cover that we're not going to be able to touch today, but I wanted to at least be able to get the environment and uh, the environment variables and the equipment to get us set up, um, how to select the plant. And um, I know that there's, um, you know, some some monitoring that you'll have to do along the way. Uh, is there like uh, a certain type of equipment that you need to test besides the environment? Like you mentioned, the humidity and the temperature. Um, is there anything in the soil that you need to test or anything on the plant material that you need to test for? Um, uh, As a home grower, um, probably not initially. You know, this is a, uh, it's a deep rabbit hole. I mean, I'm still buying gadgets. I've been growing about 13 years and I still have packages showing up regularly. <laughs> gadgets. So uh, to get started, you can really, especially if you're starting in soil, you can get started without too much as far as uh monitoring the environment other than just temperature and humidity and make sure that your life cycle is on 12, 12 or 18, six, whatever you've decided to work with. Um, that's, I guess, another area we could talk about briefly if you want is how cannabis grows, how it works. Yeah. Um, it's a photo period plant. They call it a short day plant, but it's really more of a long night. Um, the naturally the plant starts as a seed in the spring. And it will continue to vegetate, which means it's producing uh, stems and leaves and stems and leaves and just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And as the season goes on um, and the summer's nights start to get shorter, there's hormones that start to build up in the plant. And that is initially, eventually what initiates flower cycle. So the plant will just continue to get larger and larger and larger until the light gets to the point where those hormones build up in the plant and it starts to flower. Then it begins its flowering cycle. It'll spend the first three, four weeks um, stretching. It'll get a lot taller, a lot faster. It could stretch anywhere from 100% of its uh, initial height up to three, 400%. So be prepared for that. Um, and it's going to be very. Do you have to like put like tomato plants, like a stake for it to hold on to? Is it strong enough to support itself? I've seen a lot of them with nets. Do you have to yeah, do that? You Staking is the first uh, way to do it. I prefer trellising. Um, staking, it's you know you're gonna as it's as it's flowering, you're gonna put a bamboo stake or plastic stake or what it is in the ground and attach it to that. But even as that flower continues to develop, you'll end up with a lot of it which just kind of falls over like that. Um, if you can accommodate trellising, uh, it's I prefer it. Uh, the difference with trellising is once it's there, it's kind of locked in. You, the plant's not moving around anywhere. Whereas if it's a pot with stakes in it and you need to take it out of the tent or slide it on the other side of the room because you're vacuuming, um, it's going to work a lot easier that way. So, but yes, uh, in most scenarios, the plant will need some sort of additional support as it starts to get through that flowering cycle. Because <clears throat> if you did a good job, the weight of your flower is going to be too much for those stalks and they're going to start coming over. Got it. Okay. And um, time frame from from the uh, planting it or getting that a small plant, just a little baby, to the veg cycle. Um, I mean, to the flowering cycle. Is there um, a range? Is that uh, that you can give? Is that a month or? 
It can be essentially what you want it to be. Um, if you're starting from seed, generally that plant's going to reach sexual maturity in the four to six week range. Uh, if you're starting from a clone, it's essentially mature right away. You can start flowering it in the cloner if you want it to. Um, oh, okay. It's not going to get very big. Uh, that's basically how long you veg is up to you, and it's determining how big you want your um, plant to be ultimately. So the longer you veg, the bigger the plant's going to get. And, and you're controlling that with the light cycle. Correct. Yeah. So as long as the plant is, is uh, getting that minimum light requirement, which generally is about 18 hours. So we generally will have, when you start out, you'll have uh, in a clone or vegetative environment, you'll have that light on for 18 hours and then off for six hours. And as long as you keep that cycle going, it will just continue to vegetate. Um, the standard for flowering is as soon as you're ready to start flowering, you switch that to a 12 hour light cycle and that will initiate the flowering process. Um, it'll stretch for the first few weeks and the start produce little cottony looking um, flowers uh, all over the place. And then after three to four weeks, that stretching will stop and those flowers will start to fill in more to the flowers that we're used to seeing. And how long yeah. would a flower phase last? And is there That's a certain, gonna... and then how do you determine when it's over? Yeah, okay. Um, it's how long that flowering phase is, is going to be mostly up to the genetics. Um, they're going to have kind of a predetermined life. Um, varieties can be as little as I've seen some seven week varieties, eight weeks are not uncommon. Most commercial grows have everything locked in at nine weeks so that they can just rinse and repeat. Um, like I said, some of those more exotic strains might be 14, 17 weeks even. So it's really just dependent on the genetic. Um, it will, once it finishes the stretching phase and those flowers start to develop, it goes into a, a process called calyx stacking where it's just kind of building on top of <clears throat> itself. Um, and it will continue to do that and put out pistols and calyxes for several weeks and just get bigger and bigger. And you'll start to see the trichomes develop on those. Uh, it starts to get fuzzy. Um, generally, the first one of the first things you'll see is that that calyx stacking starts to slow, that pistol production starts to slow. You start seeing more of those pistols start to turn orange um, instead of white. Um, and eventually they'll stop basically producing new pistols and calyxes. And uh, another giveaway, if you have a little microscope or a jeweler's group, is those little trichomes that are all over the flower. That's what we're after. That's where all the medicine is inside of those heads of those they look like little almost translucent or transparent mushrooms all over the head of the of the flower and the leaves of the plant um, as the plant starts to mature those trichomes will turn from a uh, transparent to a translucent almost milky and eventually start to look a little amber um, and basically it's, that's where it gets more into what the preference of the grower um, at what point he harvests that it might have a dramatically different effect from the plant if you are harvested at, at nine weeks rather than if you waited to ten and a half weeks yeah well i'd yeah. imagine my first one i'm going to be so excited it's going to be hard to wait as soon as they start to get a little yeah, yeah. Cloud, I'm going to be <laughs> getting the next Find yourself a nice easy nine week variety and yeah. yeah, I want to get something fast. Um, so, all right. So now we, it's grown and it's, you know, it's telling us it's ready to go. It's finished. It's finished its growth cycle. Um, you know, cutting it right. You know, do you, is there a certain process to um, drying it and then making it smokable or however you're going yeah. to consume it? Low and slow, I guess, is uh, my advice for that. You want to dry it as slowly as possible in a cool room. I guess if you have ideal conditions or 60, 60, so it'd be 60 degrees. Would you keep it in the same 70. tent area or would you move it into another room? Uh, that's up to you. If you don't have plants that are waiting right behind to get into that tent, um, you could do it right in the tent. So you can either um, be a wet manicure where you would, you would harvest all the branches and manicure all the flower right away and then hang those in maybe a hang dryer, a mesh dryer or something like that. Uh, the more preferred method is to to dry it first and then manicure it afterwards. So uh, basically what I do is just cut the plant into branches that are, you know, a foot and a half, two feet long um, and remove, generally I remove most of the, uh, the, the fan leaves, the larger leaves that are just kind of like little solar panels. 
Uh, I'll remove those and then just hang the branches upside down in the dark um, in a cool room at a humidity that's about 60% um, or even a bit lower. And if you can keep those conditions ideal like that, it'll probably take about two weeks for those to completely dry. Um, you'll know that they are dry when the smaller stems on those branches start to snap a little bit as you start to bend them and they snap rather than giving. Um, it's probably about time to manicure that that flower up and then get it into a jar or an airtight container that uh, where it can start a curing process. And basically that's so you'll, you'll harvest the, the plant. Uh, you can choose to do a wet manicure or a dry manicure, but it'll still need to dry. Uh, if you do a wet manicure, it's probably going to dry faster. Um, and that's one of the advantages of, of hanging it on the vine uh, is it'll dry slower. Um, but once it's dry, uh, you're going to put it into a, a jar or an airtight tight container and uh, keep it in the dark in a cool place. And uh, you're going to want to slowly cure it almost like they cure tobacco. Basically, there's, there's uh, things that are off gassing from that plant for quite some time that you're going to want to allow some air exchange. So basically, you want to open that container up. Uh, Generally, right after harvest and right after I put it in jars, I'll open that container at least once a day um, as the product starts to cure. Curing is also a preference. You're going to find people that say it doesn't need to be cured or two weeks is fine. You, I know people that cure their stuff for six months. Um, it's really just a personal preference. I find terpenes evaporate rather rapidly. So um, I generally like to dry it, cure it for a few weeks, and then it should be used. Um, so, uh, you know. From the time you harvest it to the time you smoke it is a personal preference, but I'm generally in the five to six week range. Okay, that's good to good to know. All also right. Also, going to want to monitor the humidity inside that container um, and make sure that you hit the mark that you're not uh, still too much moisture or that it's too dry. Um, and one little thing you can pick up are those little hydrometers that they use in humidors. Um, you can put one of those in your container. It'll tell you temperature and humidity. And uh, you're looking for the relative humidity in that container to be in the 50s. You know, that, a little bit of personal preference there, too. I tend to like uh, 53 to 55 percent, something in that range. Um, but for basically, you want to see. Yeah. And also, you want to make sure that the moisture level doesn't get high enough that you're promoting mold growth. Because cannabis is susceptible to botrytis and all kinds of fungus. So... You want to uh, keep the humidity low enough so that you're not promoting mold growth. I'd imagine there are, but are there specific containers for curing cannabis that are out there? Or do you just put it in like a ball jar or like plastic and Tupperware? What, what do you use for? Depends on how much you have. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, ball jars are a great place to start. Uh, they're clear. So once they're in the jar, keep them in the dark somewhere. Um, but as... You know, the grocery store is going to have other stuff as well. I use actually something called a sea vault, and it's a small stainless steel container. Uh, almost looks like a, a soup kettle or something, and it has a clamp on top with a rubber seal. Um, it's got a little uh, device at the top in the lid that if you want to add a uh, humidity pack, um, it'll hold one of those for regulating the humidity. If you were to overdry your cannabis uh, too much, you can always add one of those. I tend to not like to use them, but I have used them um, if necessary. All right. Seems like we got soup to nuts here, how to get things growing. How much um, would you think to yield from a plant? Um, I know that's that's a hard question to answer, but I guess it's more space related. But from two plants, um, you know, in, in the in the three by three kind of space. Um, I mean, is there a, any sort of rule of thumb? Like, am I going to get a couple ounces per plant or? Yeah, I tend to think of it in. Uh, you know, growers talking about how much per light, um, how many per plant. I tend to think of it in square feet. How much, how much are you yielding per square foot of canopy? It sort of evens the playing field and makes a standard that we can all kind of work by. Um, commercial growers typically will, will get uh, north of a couple of ounces per square foot on a regular basis. Uh, it's not uncommon to get two and a half ounces, you know, 70 grams per square foot. I've gotten as high as I think I'm at about 120 grams a square foot off of the Mac 2 variety um, and a Kenberry that I grew that got that high. But 
generally you're probably looking in that two ounces a square foot um, if, if you're doing it right I suppose and the plant isn't stressed out I had varieties that no matter what I did to them they wouldn't break 50 grams a square foot um, but you know generally you're looking for a couple of ounces per square foot all right. So if um, if someone's wanting to get something started, could they do you offer any sort of, you know, getting started service or um, people can call you to say, hey, I I need some help. Can you do, do phone consultations or something like that? I haven't, uh, but I'm willing. I guess they could be my first. <laughs> it's something that I've considered. Um, so it's it, I'm kicking it around. And if that's an opportunity uh, out there, I guess. Look me up. I'll be happy to, to talk to you about it. See if we can okay. Yeah, well, we got one last question here for you. And good. Yeah, definitely um, reach out to Jim. He's he's open and and, offer, and open for that. And as the industry grows, we need good leaders like you that can help us. Um, we got a question here from Linda Rabinovich. Um, on a scale of 1 to 20, how challenging of a project is growing cannabis for a novice gardener? Hmm. So someone who hasn't grown anything before. It hasn't grown. Nobody's grown a tomato before. Novice gardener, you know, like maybe maybe they've had um, an aloe plant on the windowsill or something like that. But um, yeah, it's it can be uh, it's a lot creating and controlling a, a little environment. Um, you know, I, I don't know that I want to give it a number. I don't want to discourage anybody from trying it. I would say uh, it's it's a little more difficult um, than your average garden project. Um, and I mean, that's why I would advise medicine here. You know what I mean? It's not like you're just going to grow a tomato and you're, you're I mean, there's it, this plant is complex, but it's also, um, you know, maybe like a long term decision. Also, it may just be, hey, look, I'm going to do this and maybe a commitment. It may not be just, hey, let me just give it a try. Yeah, you, you, you may not. You know, it may not be the best your first run. I was going to suggest that, you know, if you can't afford to hire somebody like me, I guess, uh, you know, find somebody who's grown before that you can bounce ideas off a lot of times just talking to the guys at the grocery store. I think when I first started growing 13, 14 years ago, um, I was a pest. I was there every day asking them questions to the point where they were getting frustrated with me. Um, so get somebody in your corner that's done this before um, and spend some time doing some research online, I'd say. But, you know, it's, it's, it's not that it's hard to grow the plant. It's hard to keep the environment um, dialed in so to speak, and to keep the pests out. So if you kind of attack it from that perspective, it might be a little easier. Yeah. Well, um, thanks again, Jim. I appreciate the words of wisdom and the advice on getting started. Now, we're going to definitely have to check back in with you with some more questions, um, some advanced questions as we troubleshoot this growing <laughs> process, if you're okay with that. <laughs> Yes, I'll get the hell. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we may have to Absolutely. jump. It would be helpful to jump on um, this live stream again when we say, hey, here's a specific problem we ran into. Kind of talk yeah, us right. through. Yeah, can you do it today? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. That's right. All right, Jim. Well, thanks again, man. Anything else that you wanted to mention before we uh, shut no, down? I'm good. I hope this, uh, thanks for your time. I hope this uh, helps some aspiring growers. Uh, at least me. It's going to help me. And, and I know it'll help other people, too. So thanks. And um, I appreciate everyone that is yeah. listening. I know if we, anyone we some... wants to reach out, I, my digital, I don't have a lot of digital presence right now, but if you, you can find me on LinkedIn through Stephen. So. Sounds great, man. Thanks, Jim. I appreciate it. And we'll talk to you okay. soon. Thank you.